good evening. It's now seven o'clock, and I would like to start the meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee of the 19th of July, 23. I would like to remind everyone present that the meeting is being recorded. Um, uh, there's also one change to the agenda uh, this evening where Health Watch is included under item six. And I would like Health Watch to be continued to have an agenda item at every meeting. Um, before I start, this is my first meeting of chairing HOSC. Um, and I, as chair, I really feel it's important that everyone does have the opportunity to ask questions that they really want to ask. And I really will make, do my absolute best to ensure that that does happen. Um, i just start off with agenda item one, which is apologies of absence. And I've received apologies of absence from can, uh, Councillor Tandy. Have we any other apologies? Okay, I'm going to hand over to the next item to, um, to councillor, my deputy chair, um, because I wasn't a councillor when the last minutes were, um, the last meeting took place. Um, so if I can just hand over to you, um, councillor Polly. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. So item two on the agenda is the minutes of our previous meeting held on the 9th of March, 2023. Are there any comments on the minutes okay if we're all agreed I'd like to uh, confirm the minutes from last meeting agreed thank you right, do I need to take this right thank you I, I just need a seconder for the minutes to be agreed thank you councillor fish Okay, so we move to the third item on the agenda. I've not received any um, urgent items of business. Um, does anyone wish to raise any points on the briefing notes? No, I'll take that as a note, thank you. Um, does anyone wish to declare any declarations of interest? Councillor Polly. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we do have an item on the agenda from uh, MSE, uh, Mid and South Essex Hospital Foundation Trust. Um, in my role as a councillor, I am appointed by the council to the Council of Governors for MSE for the non-executive director. So, uh, although it's not a pecuniary interest, it, I, I feel it's of note and I have a standing interest in the fact that I'm employed by the NHS. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Polly. Um, if I can move on to um, item five, which is terms of reference. Do, do any members wish to comment on the terms of reference? No? Okay, so we're all happy with the terms of reference, yes? Okay. Thank you. Right, and we move on, on to item six, which is the integrated medical centres. And I believe we've got Alexander coming to give a presentation this evening. So I'll just pass over to you, Alexander. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is um, Alexandra McCann. I'm the Thorough Alliance Director. I'm here for the first time uh, to provide you with a brief overview of um, the update on, of the program around Thorough Integrated Medical and Wellbeing Centres, hopefully ahead of sight of the presentation as well. So I will cover the overview of the program this evening, uh, speak to you about progress in uh, Stamford, Lee, Hope and Coringham, then move to the South Ockenden and Purfleet, Tilbury and Chadwell, then discuss Brace as well as Orsett Hospital and allow time for any questions. In terms of the programme overview, uh, the first one of the four IMWCs is currently open and uh, three of those have not yet materialised on the ground and not yet funded. Coringham IMWC is being well utilised to date and um, is on the pathway for full integration. 
NHS England has to date not approved the business cases for either Perfleet or Tilbury, and the current propo proposals have been deemed as non-affordable. There's been a major step forward around GRACE, and that is due to the creation of the new um, Community Diagnostic Centre, and that will be the first element of the IMWC going forward. These last three years have been challenging for the NHS in the Mid and South Essex, uh, with resources being tight, the COVID pandemic still showing its impact, and uh, strike action absorbing number of resources and MSC ICB having to reduce in size due to the national guidance. However, together thorough council staff and MSC ICB staff have been working very closely under the programme uh, governance to examine alternative approaches to making sure that we deliver the programme as soon as possible. So in terms of Coringham, this is the pilot site of the programme, which we've opened in October 2022. We are now working towards the uh, full operating capability as an integrated facility. The outpatients and community NHS activity is busy and community health support groups are making good use of the site. Most recently, we had um, dementia services and dementia cafes joining as an example. The PCN wor is working to take on three consulting rooms and um, four additional primary care clinics. And in our view, this is a great success story of which we can learn and, um, and share, share across other sites. In terms of Averley, South Ockenden, Perthleet on the Thames, the current proposals for leasing new built uh, for IMWCs are unaffordable. Section 107 required for the developer to make the space, but not to reduce the lease costs. Separate scoping work was undertaken to address needs in South Ockenden. Those have been also unfunded. Joint MSC ICS and thorough council review of options is currently looking at alternatives to meet the needs of predicted growth in um, ASAP area. So the alternatives that we're working up now are working with Perfleet Centre Regeneration Limited to see reduced costs of the new building of IMWC Perfleet Town Centre. The second option is around establishing primary care plus dentist and pharmacy in the Perfleet new build whilst placing the additional IMC services on NHS land, either in South Ockenden or in the vacated Perfleet Care Centre. The third option is delivery of IMWC functions across two sites, based on existing medical centres in both Perfleet and South Ockenden, using expansion space available for both locations um, to support the two growing communities. This option would not use the Perfleet new build. The next one is Tilbury and Chatwell, and the current proposal for leasing the new build for IMWC from Thurrock Council in Tilbury also, sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> is also um, unaffordable. The estimated lease costs of the current proposal facility significantly and exceeds national guidelines for far more technical facilities. A joint MSC ICB and Thurrock Council review of options is also looking for alternative, uh, alternatives to improve services and meet the needs of the area. No alternative site has been identified, therefore the options that are currently being considered include um, either reducing the lease burden of the new IMWC on the old fire station site, either by reducing the size or approaching the lease in a different way. Second option is around building a new health facility on the NHS owned Tilbury Medical Centre with local authority and community facilities delivered by Thorough Council nearby. In terms of Grace, this will be the largest IMWC and the hub at the centre of the Thorough IMWC network. It will be created on the Long Lane Thorough Community Hospital site using a combination of new build and refurbishment of existing yeah. buildings to create a new facility that works well together. Work to create new community diagnostic centres is underway and the spade is likely to go in the ground this year. The CDC will become the first stage of the GRACE IMWCs. A new urgent treatment centre and children's hub will form part of the IMWC and enhanced services currently provided. The creation of the rest of the IMWCs require upfront capital and, is, and it is a significant funding challenge to do it all at once. A review of phasing of services, tra services transfers 
sorry. Yeah, sorry. A review of phasing of services transfers away from offset is being undertaken, mindful of affordability challenges. This is in respect of both services proposed for Grace and those that will be moving elsewhere. Um, in terms of Orsett Hospital, Orsett currently houses services um, for Thorac, but also services that have temporarily relocated from Basildon Hospital during COVID um, that um, need investment to return. There is a material difference between expected sale value of Orsett site and the projected cost of capacity reprovision elsewhere. The do nothing option is not viable and essential maintenance backlog is costly. And even if spent, the site would be still clinically suboptimal and unable to deliver integrated medical and well-being care across thorough communities. So full closure of um, Orsett in 2025 is currently being reviewed with phasing establishment of Grace IMWC being examined. So in summary, Coringham is up and running and work on Grace is underway. The current plans for Perfleet and Tilbury are being revised to identify viable options to deliver the integrated services for those communities. The revised options, detailed options, will be presented to HOSP in September. The closure of all set may be delayed with relocation of services being undertaken as funding becomes available. The aim of program still remains to deliver a network of integrated services to the people of Thurrock, with buildings being an enabler and not the output that will make the difference. Thorough Council and the local NHS remain committed to better care together vision and delivering the benefits of this program together for the residents of Thorough. Thank you, I'm happy to take questions, Chair. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Um, I know you're new in post um, and taking on this project, but I am totally amazed and I feel the people of Thurrock have been conned. Um, we had a hospital, and we were promised with the closure of the hospital we would have these four really top-notch health hubs across the borough. We knew it was going to be expensive. It was more expensive than actually running the hospitals. It seems we have a business case to have these uh, four hubs without appropriate funding being in place, which no business would ever do, um, I, I, I'm just absolutely shocked and dismayed by, by what I'm hearing, bearing in mind the promises that were made to the people of Thurrock seven years ago in 2016. In terms of... Um, the Tilbury site. I mean, Tilbury is the most deprived area in the borough and has the greatest health need possible. Um, will the Tilbury site and the other sites you're talking about meet the initial plans for the or, or expectations of service delivery in the, in these centres? You're talking about scaling it down, but yep. will they actually meet the needs that was actually originally set out? Will those services be there? Uh, so do you want me to address the last question first? Because I think that we had a reflection to which I can only, I, I note, and I uh, can only apologize for this program not to have the speed that you would expect it. However, we've also had a number of staff changes, interim colleagues in post. What, what I can offer is my commitment to the people and residents of Thurrock I'm now your permanent staff member and I'm here to stay. Therefore, I will do everything in my power to drive this program going forward. The commitment is there and we're doing our best to revise the options to still make those buildings um, materialize. In terms of um, the Tilbury, I completely agree and it, it is my personal aim to make sure that this one becomes our priority based on the highest deprivation and the greatest needs. What we are looking at is um, considering options that will deliver slightly smaller buildings still with functions that we've initially planned. And that is to take into account changes particularly arising from different ways of working after COVID. We've previously made plans assuming five days working in the buildings. Now we know number of teams are operating 
on a rotational basis and we want to factor that into our plans. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay, so you're, you're coming back with new proposals in September? Correct. In September, I'll be able to give you detailed options to consider. And Today, I'm outlining the approach that we're taking and the work that we're doing in the bank. Right. And we'll be able to measure the new plans to what the original plans were in terms of expectations of delivery of service. In us providing you with alternatives, and I think we refer to it as plan B, um, if you look at the minutes from us meeting, I think it was Councillor Rolf who suggested, are you developing plan B? So we are developing the plan B and we will be able to refer um, and compare what was the original plan versus what are the proposals that we're giving you for you to consider. And do we have a guarantee that Orsett Hospital will not close and that services are not taken away from Orsett Hospital till these centres are up and running. So I think you made a comment earlier about that you were promised that INWCs will happen um, after the Orsett closure. So what we're trying to do now is make sure that everything that is in Orsett now is going to be relocated. This is going to be a phased approach. Everything that arrived during COVID, we're trying to uh, decant back to where it belongs. And uh, this is where I alluded to slight delays in the initial plan of closing Orsett by 2025 we might have to do this in a phased approach, which is, um, and, and we're allowed to do that because uh, Community Diagnostic Hub is gonna happen first on site. Right. So I'm giving you assurances that we will not close it until we've got places for these services to go to yet. Okay. So the new plans would have to be approved by NHS England? Uh, depends on the type of journeys that we will want to go to. What, my proposals are, and I've discussed that with system partners, we will come to individual exec teams in respective organizations. We will go through the uh, local governance, through the uh, Thoric Alliance team as well, and then we will come to yourselves to express the um, state of play and the preferred options from system partners. I'm trying to get some sort of timeline about how long this is taking, bearing in mind we've been timeline. here seven years. Yeah, timeline that I'm working to, the options that we're working out should be ready by mid-August. I am planning to provide system partners with updates between end of September, uh, sorry, end of August to mid-September, with the view that I can come to this meeting in September with worked up plans. Does that help? Okay, anyone got any questions? Can I go to Councillor Spate, please? Um, yes, it's quite a few questions, really. Um, and also a statement um, that I, I absolutely share um, the chairman's comments. This has been a disgrace. Let's, let's make no mistake about it. The people of Thurrock, I'm not gonna say they've been lied to because that implies that consciously people have gone out and done something with intent. And I don't suspect that that has been the case. However, we've met absolute incompetence. We've met disinterest and we've met apathy about the needs of the people of Thurrock and a complete disrespect to this council. And that is in a way mirrored by what we just heard from yourself. Um, knowing the acoustics of this building, it, it is somewhat difficult to hear everything. Um, you ran through um, the plans, and read them through very quickly. Did it not cross your mind to send us a written advance report so we could study them? We could research them. We could look at the figures that you used and the statements that you made. It was just disrespectful not to give us that information. That's my statement. I'll move on to questions. In, in terms of Corringham, um, and uh, you, you used the phrase well used and busy. Now, I've been to Corringham. I've used it myself. Um, and it's certainly got a number of people there. But we want more quantification. It's not good enough to say it's busy and well used. We want to know what its operational capacity is at the moment, what its operational capacity will be when it's at full use. We want to know detail about what's going on. Just to brush it aside and say it's busy and it's well used. So can you tell me now, uh, and, and this committee, what capacity the Stanford and Corringham IMC is operating at at the moment. Chair, it's okay to um, address. 
So in terms of your statement, councillor, I would um, politely note, but also um, disagree partially in some of the statements, and I'll caveat that now, uh, to say that it's been a disrespect to the council. Council is integral part of these discussions and sits on the programme board. And for the last six months that I've been in post, I had your colleagues sat with me around the table working out those plans. So it's being done in collaboration and in partnership, both in terms of site visits, review of documentation, so on and so forth. But I, but I hear your frustration and I think it's um, justifiable. In terms of the Coringham and my updates today, uh, my apologies if the speed of speech wasn't appropriate, I can adjust it going forward. However, I was initially asked to come with a verbal update and following from that, chair requested slides. So again, we can arrange ways of working going forward to meet your needs. I can only apologize, but that was with the instructions I was given. I, I can just come in there. I have spoken to Alexander uh, before today's meeting and we've agreed that a report should be with us about 10 days before future meetings. Thank you, Chair. In terms of Coringham, the utilisation of the rooms, currently all rooms have been occupied. If we spoke months ago, they would be free and available. In terms of the clinical rooms, all of them are currently utilised. We've got BCT services, we've got um, additional roles um, working off the site, we've got dementia clinics, we've got a number of services that joined in the recent months. So they are currently at capacity, which actually makes um, more of a case for us trying to find other services and spaces across Ferrog, hence putting the more need of grace happening as soon as possible. Do we, do we have the phalanx of trainee or newly qualified GPs in place at Coringham? Are you, sorry, are you asking are they physically in Coringham or are, how many well, are If uh, We were told that Coringham would play home. Um, when originally there were going to be GP surgeries there, it was going to bring new capacity to the GP service in uh, Stamford and Coringham. That sort of drifted away on the wind and then um, we were told that the plan was to recruit uh, newly qualified GPs who would spend some of their time at the IMC, um, but they would be uh, working uh, learning skills and, and the community of Stamford and Coringham will be benefiting from their presence. Yep. And it was a substantial number of people that were going to be there. So is that happening? Yes, I'll address those in order. There is a primary care presence in Coringham at this point in time. By that, I mean therapists, um, colleagues from um, uh, ambulance, um, so on and so forth. We have two additional um, two additional GP fellows already operating in Thurrock. One is based in Orset, one is based at Pertree practice. And there are conversations with the ASOP BCN to provide GP fellow presence in Coringham going forward. By end of the year, I'm expecting to have six GP fellows in place in Thurrock. Does that answer? Because they're at different stages of recruitment. So, is this trainee scheme, is that happening then? Oh, sorry, not yeah. the, they're not trainee, the, new GP G, the newly qualified GPs. Is, that, G is that happening? Or yes. are you bringing in experienced GPs no, from no, no. other practices? GP fellows, newly qualified. Um, you, you talked about AUSIT. Uh, and, and the phrase was, you talked about the AUSIT maintenance backlog. Okay. Um, there really shouldn't be an AUSIT maintenance backlog because you, know, you had a schedule of work that's needed to be done. And if it's a case of having to redecorate, if it's a case of having to refit, if it's a case of having to replace defective windows or whatever other structures there are within the building, that's a finite written down plan that was going to happen. So I don't really understand, because you used the word maintenance. You didn't talk about new services or anything like that. You talked about the maintenance. Any building, including this one here, requires maintenance. But I don't understand how you've got a maintenance backlog. Uh, I will address this on behalf of MSCFT, but please note that, that I do not work for the trust and that is their building. So the trust has in place plan that considers reactive maintenance and planned maintenance. And because the decisions, as you said, 
have been taking so long, the hospital has not yet relocated. There's been more and more structural changes to it. I cannot comment on details of that, not to the cost of this, because they're commercially sensitive pieces of information that only MSEFT will be able to address. Th thank you for that answer. Um, I, I think it's totally unacceptable, and I, and I appreciate it may not be your responsibility, but it's just yet another example of the people of Thurrock giving, uh, being given a load of bunkum from the NHS rafts of organisations that are in place. Very difficult to quantify who's saying what and who's responsible for what. But, you know, we were told Orsett Hospital would continue, uh, you know, until the IMCs were all in place. It would, every service would be there. It would be as good as it has ever been, or if not better, given it was getting the attention. And quite frankly, that's just not happening. And it's, it's just, just an appalling example of the shocking um, state of healthcare in, in, in Thurrock across the board. Um, there are some wonderful things that happen in Thurrock. There are many great things within that NHS raft. But if you summarize and add them all together, there are far more negatives than there are far more pluses. Sorry to be negative. All right. Thank you, Councillor Spite. Um, Councillor Polly? Oh, Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I echo the comments of the other councillors about how disappointed I am to see this report tonight. Um, but I'm pleased that uh, in future, these reports are going to be coming to us before the meetings. Every report we've had in the last year or so has been shocking in a bad way. Um, and so it's good to get them in a timely way so that we can actually, as the councillor says, do proper research into what's on the paper and have a proper informed discussion about it. Um, in terms of the actual content, um, I think the only possible bit of good news, apart from Corringham, well, that seems to be working at uh, full capacity. Um, I don't know, but I do think that uh, there's been some disappointments there in terms of the, uh, the trainee doctors. It uh, wasn't quite what we were promised in the very first place. Um, so I think the only good news really is in the Greys uh, IMC is the CDC, and in talking here about the... Um, the children's services. Um, are those services going to be funded separately in the same way as the CDC? These services are currently funded through the existing routes of funding. What we're talking about is once we have um, Grace IMWC in place, we will shift those services. So uh, the, the move of them is not uh, linked to any additional funding. So that's just a, a this is the lift and what, shift. What this is going to be in the IMC once it's up and running? This is the lift and shift, okay. yes. Um, I also share concerns about the level of service that's going to be provided in the other proposed IMCs um, because as time's gone on, we, we, first of all, we were looking at uh, purpose-built accommodation for the new services. And now we're talking about housing them in the existing health centres, um, which doesn't sound to me as if you're going to have the space to provide the services that you that were originally envisaged. So um, I wait for, I wait with uh, anticipation for the report in September, and I really look forward to having that in a timely way so that we can actually properly interrogate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fish. Councillor Polly. Thank you very much, Chair, and welcome to HOSC. Um, I think you know from observing previous ones, um, Tiffany has had quite a robust um, questioning from the committee, and I'm not ashamed of that. I, I absolutely stand by it, and sometimes our frustrations are because we all live here. The, these are our families, these are our relatives that are not getting the level of care. But to go to a practical point, if I may, picking up on Councillor Spate's point, 
And again, Councillor Fish referring it to it. On page six, we, at the beginning of this meeting, we agreed the minutes as a true record. Agreed? So, on page six, there, there are meant to be, just for clarification, because you didn't seem clear, there are meant to be 12 fellows at the Corringham uh, IMC. Um, and Tiffany was asked how many fellows were working in the Corringham IMC today at that meeting. Mm -hmm. She wasn't able to answer us, yeah. but she made a clear understate, a clear under, a clear statement that she would come back, give, gave us an undertaking that she would come back to this meeting tonight and tell us. You've just been asked how many GPs are there, and that information is missing. And that, I think, summarises how this ball just keeps getting dropped. There's no continuity. The people, the, the continuity are us, the host members, the, the, the elected members. We, so th that, I'm disappointed. A specific question was asked and we asked for that to come back. It's not come back. Now I can go through individual IMCs or I can sort of give you my my four main questions in one lump, it's up to you. Would and you like me to address the point about the GP fellows first? So can I just clarify, are you just saying that the number wasn't included in the presentation or because I feel like I verbally no, just updated the, you about the numbers? Sorry, Did my point was there's, there's no doubt the figure was 12. It has always been 12 furloughs was the agreed was the agreed um, amount of people yeah. that that the IMC at Corringham would come, and that was down to sponsorships from the various um, hubs, and as you say, one at Pear Tree, one at mm -hmm. um, so that they may not all be based at, at Corringham, and I understand. Yeah that logistically they might not be, or they might be there and somebody in Perfleet might get sent for an appointment at the hub, whichever, but it was within Thurrock. So can, um, I, can I so respond to that? Apologies, Councillor Polly, can I respond to that? So apologies if I haven't made it clear. The intention to recruit 12 still remains. When I said six by end of the year, that was my clarity that this is the, by this end of this year, we are aiming to have six of them in post because number of them are still at different stages of the recruitment. The further recruitment continues, end game remains the 12. Does that clarify? And apologies if I wasn't clear in my reply to Councillor Fish in that matter. Oh, okay, apologies for that then. Lovely, thank you. I don't know that I've made myself clear. There is an undertaking in the minutes that today we would be told clearly how many GPs are at that IMC. You haven't got that information. It hasn't come back. When Cancer Spate was trying to um, ask direct questions, we were not getting direct answers. And this, this is just systemic. Every time we have a presentation on the IMCs, we we have to requote things um, to Tiffany, and it now appears the same. The 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 amount of times I think, and Councillor Fish, Councillor Piccolo, um, and I'm sure people with the Health Watch that have been on the committee a long time, repeatedly, there's there's. There's ne we've never wavered. The services and the actual functionality of AllSit does not close until we have these other services. At the moment, we're, you've made references that there'll be places to go for those other services. We're already experiencing problems with Basildon, uh, for example, with the phlegotomy services, where due to lack of resources and, and staff, they're centralising services. Everything's being drawn back into uh, Basildon Hospital. That, that, 
to just say that there will be services, there will be places for people to go, that, that could be Broomfield, that could be South End. It, it's too vague it, and, and it gives me great concern. I've got some specifics about the other centres, if you, if you... So, I, I, I'd only echo other councillors and chairs' comments that uh, this is probably the worst news you could have brought to us to, to act. We, we've asked and questioned and said at other meetings that it was looking increasingly unlikely, but to actually hear that the, um, the business cases for the Perfleet and the Tilbury ones have now uh, been abandoned uh, is, is devastating news, to be truthful. Um, on the, we, we've now developed uh, ASOP. So there was the Perfleet on Thames, IMC, and there was even a suggestion at one point that there would be a fifth IMC to service the further west of the borough, the Avely and the South Ockenden. To see it now all grouped together, that is the first time I have ever heard of it being referred to as ASOP. That is the first time that I've... And given that the west of the borough has taken probably the most growth over the last 10 years in Thurrock, we've, we've continued uh, inaccessibility to GP uh, referrals. We've got no uh, clinics as such over there. Um, that, that gives me great concerns. And as regards to the options, if, if we have been, as you state, working closely with our directors, and we do have a po portfolio sitting in the, in the gallery there, I, I want this message clear, absolutely clear, that we, we cannot see the closure of Orsit until these services are delivered. And that, that is something we've been promised throughout. And, and if, if you need us as HOSC to make any representation, I'm sure the chair will take that to minister if we need to, because this, the thought of you coming back with a business case or of the start of a business case in September and waiting another six, seven years for, for any spade in the ground, I, I think it's a total disservice. Sorry, I'm rambling rather than asking questions. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, the Grays IMC, uh, Councillor Fish uh, asked about the uh, children's hub. When we say children's, what, what age groups? Are we, is that paediatrics? Is that up to 16? Or is, uh, and what what type of so is, is that? Is that part of the urgent care treat, urgent treatment centre? Again, these are slides, and I concur with everybody else's comments. There's, there's no meat on the bones. There's nothing for us to read here. It's just a presentation. So, if you could answer me, um, what the services at Grays are likely to be for the children? Um, And the, the full site closure of 2025, we have previously been told that the existing running costs of all sit are exorbitant and that they, they far outweighed one of the business cases for one of the other IMCs. So I don't see how something could be declared as not fit for purpose seven years ago is still being used and at the moment is going to be used in perpetu like perpetually until we, we have any more IMCs. I, I don't understand the rationale in that. Thank you. Alexander. Chair, if I may reply. Um, so I'll take those points um, in order. In terms of um, your comment about the business cases being abandoned, can I clarify they have not been abandoned? We were instructed by uh, council and ICD leads to provide plan B as per the minutes from last TOSC meeting. 
and this is what we're currently doing. So we are redrafting those business cases in order to explore solutions that can make them affordable. And the purpose of the presentation today was to brief you on the work that is happening in the background so that we can have those plans ready for the other side of the summer. So apologies if that wasn't clear. When I refer to ASOP, I mean the ASOP PCN area. This is still referred to as per fleet business case. However, in the plan B, the developing plan B options, we are also considering South Auckenden because this was included in the initial consultation and we have checked that with the council colleagues who are part of our program board. This is why this is an option on the table. In terms of the proposals for the children's hub, again, these conversations are in the early stages and we're looking at zero to 18 year old services, um, early years provision, speech and language therapy, um, also looking at dental provision uh, because oral health in Thurrock um, has significant needs that we want to address. Does that answer your question? And as I said, the purpose of coming today was to let you know what we're doing about developing plan B, which will come to you in due course in September. So did you just quote to me that it was in the minutes of the last HOSC that we asked for a plan B? Yes. There was a question asked, I believe, of Tiffany Henning by Councillor Rolf, I want to say, who said, what are you doing about developing plan B and contingencies? But happy to be stand corrected. Do you have a copy of the minutes? On page six. Uh, I think the, the comment that Alexandra is referring to is on page six of the minutes, uh, Councillor. It's the third from bottom paragraph. Perhaps after this meeting, then you can enlighten me because I can't read anywhere there that it's saying come back with a plan B for free IMCs. Okay. Uh, you got any further, anyone got any further questions? Councillor Pickard. Thank you, Chair. Um, this wasn't particularly relevant at the previous meetings, but um, as we, we know anyway in Thurrock, there's been a change to some of the bus services um, <coughs> that are now supplied. Um, I'm concerned especially for the perfect one, um, that there's going to be sufficient transport links um, so that people can access, because if there's some services that are now going to come out of the perfectly hub that aren't available in some of the other hubs, um, I'm concerned at the, the ability for people to access it. And if there aren't bus services that run there, um, is there going to be adequate parking? Um, and I say, it, it's only arisen recently because of the reduction of some of the bus services um, that are going to be supplied locally. Would you like me to address that? Um, in terms of looking at per fleet, this is where in the background we're doing services utilisation work to understand what type of services are needed by particular um, areas in terms of the population split. We are aware that bus is, and parking is a challenge. I believe you've discussed that as well in the previous meeting. We have spoken to HealthWatch as well to seek their advice of what would be acceptable for local population to accept in terms of time of travel. Uh, we are factoring those into discussions. Again, once I provide you with options, I think we will be able to then risk stratify are those viable based on the transport links, but difficult to speculate at this point in time. Does that answer? Thank you. Okay, Alexander, thank you so much for your presentation today. Sorry, Neil, sorry, you've got another question. Sorry. Yeah, it, it is a question, but it's also because you've stuck your head in the lion's den for, and, 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 got it, and got it pretty firmly bitten off um, and, and obviously relatively new to the position. I, th I think, and, and, and Councillor Polly 
made the point that we live this on a daily basis, our families live it on a daily basis, um, and it's just been going on for so long. And, and while other members are asking questions, I, I just looked through some of the, the past records. I'm looking at the minutes on Wednesday, the 6th of June, 2018, of the Mid and South Essex Sustainability and Transformation Partnership. We have lots of these things with lots of different titles. Um, I'm looking at a copy of the Thurrock Gazette in July 2018, and we're hearing all these things that we just keep hearing, 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 hearing. And, and, and to put one of those in context, it was said at those meetings that were reported by the Gazette and, and, and are recorded in the minutes, um, that in 2018 it was estimated that to bring Orsett Hospital up to scratch to the best possible standard that it could be, was going to be £10 million. So if we'd have spent £10 million, or committed to spending £10 million in 2018, we'd have a really cracking Orsett Hospital now, instead of one which has got a maintenance backlog and which is still earmarked for closure by a thousand slices. Um, and so I, I sort of wish to apologise if you feel that you're getting a, a bit of a turning over and a roasting and, and that we're being brutal, but the reason that we're being that way is that, frankly, I'm a resident, I'm a local journalist who's covered this right since day one. I remember meetings in the Civic Hall when you know, public servants came along, representatives of Basel and Hospital, representatives of this trust, representatives of NELF stood and walked around tables where we'd got genuine residents there and they made promise after promise after promise after promise that had been completely unfulfilled. And then you just look back and you think, if we'd have spent 10 million pounds, which in the scheme of things in Thurrock is, is a very small fry amount of money, we wouldn't have this. So we just seem to be making the wrong decisions all the time. And I really echo what my fellow councillors have said. Now, it's not a question. I just hope that you will take it away. I appreciate it's not your particular problem. And that's one of the problems. There are so many layers of health administration now. Everybody can say, not my problem and not take responsibility. But I just hope you'd take away the fact that a simple fact, if in a business world, in 2018, in the real world of commerce and industry, and somebody was having, developing a factory or a process or a business, because that's what everybody tells us we should treat health as. If they'd have spent that 10 million pounds, we'd have been in a heck of a better place now. And sometimes we have to make decisions that may be painful at the time with a view to what happens in the future, rather than putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I just wanted to get it off my chest. Okay, thank you, Councillor Spate. Okay, Alexander. May, may I just address quickly, I, um, if I may, Councillor and Chair, I think it's very helpful to have the history from all yourselves. Uh, however, you've got my commitment of making this happen. I'm an SRO for this programme, and I would absolutely expect you to hold me to account. What I would like to is offer my commitment to working forward with you so we can spend time discussing how we can make it happen in the future rather than discussing the past. In terms of not my responsibility, I only use those words in the context of I cannot comment on behalf of the trust and the finances. So it is absolutely my responsibility because this programme sits under me as a SRO. In terms of the comments from 2018, Again, difficult to again, hear frustrations, but between 2018 and now we had massive pandemic, increase in cost of concrete. So very difficult for me to make any statements around that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Alexander. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm really getting annoyed now. Look, we're talking about a decision and a statement that was made in July 2018. You know, you can't throw COVID in because nobody in 2018 knew anything about COVID hadn't even been created. I'm so sure you had an opportunity to make a decision in 2018 and you, and I'm saying you, the NHS, had a decision and an opportunity to do it and you didn't. And now to blame COVID, look, COVID was horrendous, but you can't just use it as a convenient excuse for complete failure, sorry. Okay, thank you, Councillor Spoke. Look, Alexander, I've, I've met with you a few times. I, I feel confident that you will work closely with us and provide members of the council with information in a timely manner and we really look forward to working in partnership with you so we can get the best possible health care for the people of Thurrock. And I know we've got the commitment from officers to do that too. So thank you for your time. Sorry if it's been a hard meeting but 
um, I, I think words needed to be said. So thank you very much. Right, shall we move on to our next agenda item? Um, which is item seven, the ICB Community MSK and Pain Service. I think we've got a presentation from uh, Mr. Jeff Banks and Ms. News. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, really grateful for the opportunity to bring uh, forward some information about this new um, pathway that we've been developing. Um, I will just say a few words just to give a bit of contextualization, then I'll hand over to Emily, who's our Deputy Director for System Pathway Development, who will talk through the specific proposals and answer any questions together. Um, but just to say that the uh, musculoskeletal and uh, pain pathway um, proposal that we're bringing forward is a new service for um, residents from 16 plus, which is designed to tackle variations in access and outcomes across these important areas of healthcare. And these are partly due to some inconsistency historically um, when the uh, integrated care system was made up of a number of different CCGs, clinical commissioning groups. And what we're trying to do here is to make sure that there's a consistent service across the whole area, uh, which we've been able to do um, since we brought the um, integrated care board together in July last year, which brings together all of those um, uh, clinical commissioning areas. Um, this new service covers trauma and orthopedics, rheumatology, uh, pain management and therapies into a single MSK pain uh, service for all of MSE, Mid and South Essex. Uh, in developing this, um, pro these proposals, we have undertaken, colleagues have undertaken extensive engagement um, through surveys and through um, engagement with partners. Uh, and we're very pleased to bring forward this, um, these proposals uh, and are taking them to other partnership boards as well around the area. But I'll hand over to Emily who will talk through a little bit about the service and give some information about what residents will be able to expect from this. Um, thank you, Jeff, and good evening, everybody. Um, just picking up on what Jeff said about trying to um, bring together the services that we already have to address some of the inequalities and the outcomes. The main one at the moment is around access to these services. So at the moment, across Mid and South Essex, there are 10 different ways of access accessing these services. Um, we want to move that to one single point of access so that everybody's very clear exactly where they need to go. We also want to introduce a self-referral option so that patients can actually access the service directly without needing to go through their GP. This is something that some areas of Mid and South Essex have at the moment, but you don't have here in Thurrock. So that will be a benefit specifically for the Thurrock population in being able to self-refer themselves into these community services. There's also different elements of service provision available across Mid and South Essex. So at the moment in some areas, um, you can have access to hydrotherapy as part of a treatment programme, but that's not available in others. So um, we're, we're moving forward to have the best service for the best outcomes for everybody um, by bringing them all under that centralisation. Now, I use the word centralisation um, in terms of what's on paper, not in terms of service provision and areas of provision. We currently have 24 different sites um, where these services are delivered across Mid and South Essex. 20 of those are NHS premises and four are privately owned where space is rented. With regards to future provision, we um, expect and will mandate that those 20 NHS sites will continue to be used. Um, there are the four sites that aren't NHS aren't in the Thurrock Borough Council area. Um, but what we're actually expecting is that the number of total sites will grow, so we'll actually have more local sites available for patients that need to access face-to-face -face services. There will also be um, a, a, a digital element overlaid, so for those that are digitally enabled, there will be um, apps and education available through, through smart technology, etc. We will introduce an element of virtual appointments, which is something that people are becoming more used to in health and social care at the moment. 
That said, though, there will still be the traditional methods. So if, if your preferred route is to go to your GP and be referred from your GP, that will still be available. Um, if your preferred route is still to have a face-to-face -face assessment and receive face-to-face -face, um, exercise teaching, etc., that will also still be available. So it's very much a combination um, of the old with the new as, as technology and healthcare advances. In terms of uh, why we're doing this now, the contracts that we have in place are coming to an end, so it gives us a natural pause in the contractual relationships to review what we've got and what we might want to do differently. There's also a lot of new national best practice, um, clinical guidelines and, and kind of patient-facing best practice that's been released, which we've adopted into these. And you'll see on the um, second page of the report that we've got the, the very summary high level, sorry, third page of the report, we've got the very high level pathway um, that you can see there, which follows through that single point of access and a clinical triage, which is, you do have at the moment in Thurrock, but isn't happening everywhere across the patch. And then a variety of services that will be delivered in a multidisciplinary way. So as, as a patient, you won't necessarily know that you're seeing an MSK therapist or a podiatric surgeon. Um, you will just be receiving integrated care. Um, from, from the NHS, from this service. And there will be direct referral pathways. So if you're then determined that you do need an acute care, you do need specialist intervention, you'll be referred directly into the hospital. So you won't need to go back to primary care for your GP to refer you on. Um, just to expand a little bit on some of the consultation that we've done um, in the engagement processes that we've taken forward, we have done two surveys overall. We also spent some time Colleagues spent some time in the clinics with patients speaking to them live and asking for their experiences. We've included a snapshot of the comments, um, but what we were really focusing on was actually what did you think of our proposals going forward? And 90% felt that having the single point of access was a very good idea. 96% felt that self-referral was a very good idea. Um, and equally, linking back to some of the pressures we're seeing in primary care, and particularly for GP appointments, if you don't need to have a GP appointment to be able to access MSK and pain services, that will release capacity in primary care for patients with other conditions and other concerns. Um, we are taking a business case to the ICB board, so to the board of the Integrated Care Board for a decision on how we progress from here. So this is very much just the first stage of our journey. Um, once that business case has been through our governance processes, we'll be able to provide a lot more information with regards to some commercially sensitive elements such as financing and activity um, and the expectations that we, we see from that. Um, but at this stage, obviously, just here to update you on the work that we've done to date um, and to answer any questions you might have. And obviously, if we can't answer something now because of the commercial elements, we're happy to take that offline um, and update you outside of a public forum. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Um, Councillor Fish. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Um, I'm interested in how it's going to work in practice. So, for instance, you say you've got a single point of access for all of these different... There, there were so many different uh, ways to access the service before. <coughs> What's that single point of access going to look like? It's a, a call centre where people phone up? Uh, yes, it will be. Um, it will have many channels, so there will be the traditional way of receiving electronic referrals from primary care, which happens now. Oh. There will also be a call centre option for people that want to phone up to, to self-refer into it. There's also high, um, likely to be an online option as well for self-referrals, so people can, can go on and self-refer through the internet and through a secure portal um, as, as well. So there, there will be those options. What we'll be doing at the next stage of the programme is getting really... Um, really embedded in the numbers so that we can start having a look at actually, well, how many people are likely to access online? How many people will still be referred? How many people are likely to want to do that over the phone just so that we can make sure we right-size the service? Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, you mentioned about the hydro pool as an example. So that you're not suggesting that we're gonna have lots more hydro pools. You're suggesting that everybody can have access to that hydro pool. It's not necessarily the physical building, it's about having access to hydrotherapy. So it might be that there are sessions rented from local leisure centres where that hydrotherapy will occur. And that's what happens now um, at the Basildon Sporting Village, for example. They use the facilities there to deliver some hydrotherapy. So we're not suggesting that we'll actually be building swimming pools. It will be about using local community resources. Okay, and then the other concern I have was about the, um, the digital side of it. 
Um, in that situation, I mean, I would much prefer myself to use the service digitally than have to actually go somewhere, physically go somewhere. But there are people who obviously don't have that option, don't have those digital uh, capabilities. Um, can you give us a guarantee that those people won't become the sort of uh, at the end of the queue? Um, absolutely. So the, the decision about whether or not people want to access the service um, and the treatments digitally or face to face will be part of a shared decision making approach at the initial assessment with the patient. Um, so pe patients will be able to say, uh, you know, um, will be able to give their preference and what they would like and that will be in, uh, integrated into their personal care plan in terms of their treatment. Um, every patient will be will be treated in date order. So if you are accessing services non-digitally, we will expect you to receive those in the same timely manner that you would online. Obviously, accessing anything online can be quicker. You know, you'll send a link, you can log on that evening. Whereas if you're waiting for a face-to-face -face appointment, there will obviously be, you know, a couple of weeks you will have to book in and go to the next available slot. But in terms of actually referral to treatment time, um, we'll, we'll be ensuring there's no disparity depending which of those routes you go down. And similarly, for the self-referral versus a GP referral, we'll make sure that those are equitable as well. Okay, thank you. I'm sure this, is, this item or this issue will come back to the... Uh, committee for us to uh, see how things are going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fish. Uh, Ms. James. Thank you, Chair. Um, I spoke to Jeff earlier, but I'd like this noted, please, that um, us as a health watch were not involved in this. It states all three health watches, but we had no contact about it. And neither did South End, because I checked today with one of my colleagues, but unfortunately, we didn't get hold of anybody in um, Essex to see whether they'd picked any of it up. I feel that with only 90 responses, we probably could have had a lot more. And there's no way of knowing whether any of those are actually thorough residents. And with a, knowing the local patches we do, we so could have worked with them to get more responses. Um, and unfortunately, the one thing I needed to look at to... to was a, a document that's embedded in this paper that nobody can open, which gives a, it says that it is the breakdown of where and who the full online survey results, which would have shown if it was any thorough residents, and we weren't able to open that. So we have no way of knowing whether any of those people were actually thorough residents and whether they were consulted. Thank you. Thank you for that point and, and thank you for bringing it to my attention earlier and I'm glad we had an opportunity to speak about it and uh, as you know Kim, I've, I, I am fortunate to sit in the directorate that has the engagement and communications team sitting alongside me so I will undertake Chair to go back and just to drill down to just ascertain um, how and where we engage or we understand we engage with health watch bodies and just to make sure that if there was an oversight there that we would correct that on any future engagements that we do and my apologies if there was an oversight there. Um, we would also chair uh, make sure that we forward to the committee um, the embedded document that gives the details but what I will just double check is that there isn't any identifiable data in there. I don't think there will be. It will probably just be postcodes, but, but we will just make sure that we uh, provide that onto the committee and our apologies as an embedded, paper, uh, embedded link in the paper that you couldn't access. Um, Kim, as you know, we're very, very firmly committed to having a really positive and comprehensive engagement with residents across the Mid and South Essex area. And you know that I've been and attended a number of workshops and sessions here. And I know we've had really positive involvement of residents in Thurrock, not only in specific projects like this, but also in our wider integrated care strategy development. So you have my undertaking that we will definitely drill down into that. We'll identify if there are any problems with that and we'll report back to this committee. But thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so, yes, sincerest apologies for the embedded document. Um, I, I didn't appreciate that this would be put into a PDF pack, so next time we'll make sure that we, we separate those out so that you can see them. Happy to share it, though. There's no, no patient identifiable information within it, so that, that's not a problem at all. Um, I did have a look earlier today at the respondents um, and the spread across Mid and South Essex, and just over a sixth were from the Thurrock Borough Council area. Okay. Um, sorry, Neil. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm a, I often have already said in my brief tenure in this chamber that if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you always get. So I do welcome the fact that we look at change and that change leads us to a better way forward. I absolutely accept that. Um, I'm slightly concerned um, about, and I know we're at the very early stages, but we run into danger if we don't deal with the, you know, the foundations at the beginning, we end up in the situation that we were speaking about earlier. And you talk about the, one of the disadvantages, and I have two points on the disadvantages. Um, you talk that, the, that one of the disadvantages is that there is a resource required to undertake a successful procurement process. Can you quantify that, please? I can. That, that references the resources required within the Integrated Care Board um, and partners to undertake that process, so actually to undertake the procurement process. Um, so you, you would normally establish a project team that would involve some clinical input, that would involve some patient representation, it might involve one of the health watches, um, for example. So there is always, for any procurement, there is a resource requirement in terms of the actual um, procurement process itself, particularly around the evaluation um, of those bids and then obviously the mobilisation. Um, so it's, it's, related, it's regarding the resource, um, the human resource, shall we say, rather than a, a financial resource, although obviously um, the people resource does require funding. Which is where my concern lies, in that um, they're, they're, that's, that's a very erudite explanation of resource. Um, but unfortunately, at some point in time, somebody's, somebody or someone or somewhere or some organisation is going to have to pay for that resource. Um, you know, it's very easy to put things down on paper and, and say, yes, you know, but it, it, this is a disadvantage. It is recognised that it's a potential stumbling block. I mean, how much money are we talking about? Um, and I appreciate what we're talking very broad brushstrokes. How much money in very broad brushstrokes are we talking about and where is it going to come from? So the funding would come from the ICB, so it would come from the Integrated Care Board. Um, it would involve a number of employees of that, so that's, that's more around utilisation of existing resource rather than additional funding. With regard to additional funding that would need to be sought, um, and that is part of the business case that's going to the board, so alongside the actual business case, there is the financial analysis of any funding that would be required to make it happen. Um, you'll be looking at things like funding and clinical sessions for clinical leads. So you're looking probably about six to eight sessions per clinical lead across that process. So you would normally have somebody who's a specialist um, in the area. You'd have somebody representing primary care, for example, so that they can be assured that it, it interfaces correctly at the front end of the pathway. Um, so that's where you're, you're usually um, getting resource from. And then obviously we do fund any, um, any expenses for any patient reps that would be involved in that process as well. So it's not huge amounts in terms of additional funding. Um, and that is part of the business case that's going to the ICB board. Yeah, OK, thank you for that. I, I just hope then that when this says it will come back to us, you know, we, we get more, more uh, appropriately, more flesh on the bones. Um, uh, and, and the other question that I was going to ask, you talk about the risk that no bids are submitted. One assumes that you are pretty confident that there, is, uh, there are people and organisations out there uh, who would be able to fulfil this service. Uh, and how likely is it that no one would come forward? Highly unlikely, um, but it is a risk. So we, we do obviously note it, um, and with the, the, this is obviously a summary of the, of the risks that we've got, but within, a, within the risk register itself, that will be showing as a low risk. And obviously there are mitigations to that. We'd have a market engagement event at the beginning of the procurement process, and that would give us a real live feel for how many parties were interested. Um, but the MSK market is very buoyant. It is very large. There are a lot of players in it. So, so my personal view is that that's highly unlikely that nobody would be interested. Okay, th thank you for that. Uh, that's really informative, and I look forward to, to following through. And just one thing to echo Councillor Fish, um, and then relate it to um, something that, that you just said um, regarding digital, um, and, and how you know, I, it terrifies me um, that we are leaving so many people behind because of the drive for digital. And I can give you an example this very week when um, a member of my ward asked me if I could help her and her husband, they were both 81, get a parking permit. They used to get a bus or drive into Thurrock or Grays. They'd walk into the council building, they'd get a parking permit and they'd go home. It would possibly take an hour. 
took an hour and 20 minutes sat in their kitchen to get that parking permit through failures on the system, it crashing, it holding up, not being able to get the right documentation. And I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near a genius, but I'm not a complete Luddite either, and I can handle a computer and what we got. And it took me working with them an hour and 20 minutes. So the statement that it is, it is always quicker online is not true, because how do we have the service for them to come and get their pass? They would have had it, got it, had it at home, and be sat having a cup of tea. And I just make that point. We sometimes forget there are still a vast number of people. And also, they, they may be able now to handle digital. Let's not forget, you know, there may be, but we know there are increasing rates of dementia. We know people are living longer and becoming more difficult, but they still want to retain their dignity and the ability to live on their own. And, and I really worry an awful lot that we rush down digital, 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 and in the theory, well, well they, those old silver heads, they'll die away and, and then it won't be a problem. Well, it will be a problem and it'll be a problem that grows with us. So please, please, heartfelt plea, you know, whatever you do digitally, make sure there is also alternate provision for those that don't want to be digital. Um, so I've absolutely been where you are for, for friends, neighbours, friends of the family, helping them navigate some of the... the, the um, online um, mazes to get things done. So, so I completely hear where you're coming from. We do actually have a digital app that we're piloting at the moment for MSK services called Get You Better, um, which we, we were lucky enough to receive some funding for. And what that's allowing us to do is to get some real time patient experience and feedback on how easy is it to use, um, would they prefer to have had something face-to-face -face rather than digital? And we'll be able to feed that into the next phase of the project. Um, so absolutely, there will be a non-digital way of doing things. But for the digital, we want to make sure that's as user-friendly as possible. Could I just add to that point, um, Councillor, that it, it, it's a point we hear regularly across the system. Um, and we are very mindful of the digital divide. And we know that that digital divide changes over time as people um, become more uh, comfortable using IT technology to access services. But we also acknowledge that that isn't always permanent because sometimes feel people might feel comfortable at a particular time, but then as their condition or circumstances change, they may feel less comfortable. Um, we have heard that very clearly in the integrated care system. And there is, I think, a system-wide commitment to ensure that we never go to a single digital solution that means that uh, uh, we, we, we uh, exacerbate the inequality um, by reinforcing uh, th those divides. So we will always ensure that there are opportunities for people to access services in a range of different ways. And, and picking up on the point earlier, this proposal doesn't represent a single point of access. It actually, it actually proposes multiple points of access to a single consistent service, if that makes sense. So in, in relation to Councillor Fisher's point earlier, um, we're just wanting to make sure that the experience is the same, but actually that there is still a varied multiple points, and in fact, a more, a more uniformly wide range of different ways that people can access these services. Okay, thank you very much. I feel like I need to move things on a bit. Um, can I just ask members, because I mean, there's some information missing, are you happy to move to the motion? Or would you like more information before we move to motion? Happy to move to motion? I'll read out the recommendations. It is that members of Thurrock Hosts are invited to support the plan to implement a new single community MSK and pain service details of which are set out in this paper. The service will offer uh, equitable provision and pathway for all residents in Mid and South Essex. Are we in agreement? Right, there's been agree. Against. So one against and four agreed. Yes? Okay. So it's Thank you. Okay, um, I um, omitted Care Watch earlier, so I do apologise to, to Kim. So, are you going to give a report today? Um, yes, please, if I can just Sorry. raise some points that could maybe be noted for the future mm. to look at. Right. 
Can I just say thank you to you both? Okay, thank you. Kim. That's fine. Um, as the committee knows, at Health Watch, we spend a lot of time out in the community speaking to people about their lived experience of services. We also take quite a lot of complaints and issues which normally revolve around primary care. But the reason that I've asked today to have this noted and maybe somebody to come and speak to us or at least give us some guidance on this, we have had a vast amount of patients in the last month, six weeks, who are having real difficulties with services from the hospital. So it seems to be Guyney from Basildon that there's a lot of problems with people being put on two week pathways and just never hearing again. They go for their appointment, they're in a cancer pathway and they're still waiting weeks and weeks afterwards for some kind of feedback. We've also got the same problem with South End. Um, people being admitted, having surgery, being discharged and not even knowing what grade their cancer is, was it cancer, and no real support out in the community, they're not being referred back into community support. Now, we are all fully aware that there are, there has been and is problems around discharge letters. Absolutely don't know if it's anything to do with that. The GPs are struggling to find out anything for the patients as well. But some of them are really serious and some of them are a major concern and we just cannot get any answers the same as these patients can't. I have spoken to Alex and I've passed a lot of them to her and they are going to look into it. But we've got patients sitting out there who from you know, November having had biopsies done have no idea whether they are, whether they have cancers, whether there's any more service for them. So it absolutely needs to be looked into. I have shared the information um, as I say, with Alex, it's been passed on, but I do think somebody needs to step in and, and see what's happening. They can't be the only ones. They're just the ones we know. Thank, Thank you, you, Kim. Alex, is this being looked into? Yes, yeah, Chair. Um, the minute we've met with Kim, we went one by one uh, through individual cases and allocated um, uh, respective actions. So we're speaking to clinicians, we've spoken to hospital already, so this is now being um, actioned at place. And then we have also made some of those formal complaints due to the process failures. So again, I can't provide you with more details because of obviously the patient confidentiality, but this is being handled at place. Would you be in a position to come back at the next meeting um, with some information? Because I'm really concerned that we don't repeat this and that if there is a system failure that it's picked up and responded to. I mean, this is quite concerning, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Are there any other points, Kim? Any other questions? Just ask mine. Um, Kim, perhaps you and I will speak outside of this meeting because obviously as I declared at the beginning I do sit on the Council of Governors so I could also bring that up through through the Council of Governors if you, if that would um, help. Thank you. Anything that puts it on the radar has got to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fish. <coughs> yeah. Um, Kim referred to uh, discharge, the problem with discharge letters, um, and she said people are aware of it. I'm not aware of what the problem is. So it's, it sounds bad, so I'd like to know a bit more about that. Would you like Alex, to address, Chair? Yeah. Uh, sorry, do you want me to dis outline the problem in this meeting or outside of the meeting? Sorry, just for clarity. Now, we had, um, there has been an IT issue identified by the MSCFT hospital, which resulted in delay in um, issuing discharge letters to some of the practices. Um, some patients received those directly. Some of these letters um, did not re reach their um, GP practices. This matter is being managed and uh, led by MSCFT hospital, so I would not be in a position to give more details of that, but again, briefings to the um, size and consequences of that have been provided to Health and Wellbeing Boards 
uh, previously. So again, happy to brief you in detail outside if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Okay, am I okay to move on to the next item? Um, which is a CQC um, report on Basildon Hospital. Have I got someone to talk on that? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Hi. Are, are, are you, are you can Fiona you hear Ryan? No? No. I'm Diane Sarko, the chief nurse. All right. Okay, can thank you. Can people hear me okay? Yes, yes, carry on, Diane, yes. please. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for inviting me to give a, a verbal update. Fiona is unfortunately unable to uh, come. Um, so just in terms of context, the, the CQC uh, came in January and February and inspected uh, medical core services um, across uh, MSE. Um, this was triggered by an increased number of complaints uh, by patients to the CQC. Um, they inspected just the medical core services on each um, site. Um, and as you'll be aware, the report was published uh, in June of this year, rating medical core services as um, inadequate. Clearly, this simply is not good enough uh, for our patients. Um, there were, they issued us a warning notice, which means um, some issues required urgent um, action. If I just briefly tell you what they uh, were, um, one was documentation of risk assessments we undertake on patients. Uh, two was estates and facilities um, uh, works. Three was nutrition and, and hydration of our patients, and that was both the provision of food, but also uh, the documentation of food to our patients and the support and care given to our patients um, to eat. Uh, three was around the care of patients with mental health issues and in, in particular mental capacity assessments and deprivation of liberty uh, assessments um, for patients. And then the wrap around all of this was around um, governance, so the correct reporting um, of these things. Um, so this was clearly very disappointing and, as I've said, not, um, not the standards we um, would want our patients to uh, receive. Um, uh, the important things, and I'd like to go through with you, are, are some of the actions that have taken, but I think importantly, uh, how we ensure sustainability moving forward and, and also to ensure how we don't get back to the position that perhaps we were um, in. We have, may I add, that we the CQC did visit last week. Um, we had two inspectors on each site um, for one day. Um, the verbal feedback, um, we've only received verbal feedback, is that they noticed uh, improvements in all areas. We are awaiting, obviously, the report from the CQC in terms of the detail of their uh, findings. Um, just uh, just going through a few things. So uh, a lot of what they found in January work had already commenced. Um, we'd identified some concerns already, and so that work had already uh, commenced. Um, we've changed our approach uh, in terms of monitoring of the care, um, and to use um, the, the saying uh, that the see it or say it, see it, uh, do it. Um, we, we've very much done that. Rather than continue doing lots of audits, which is what had previously been done, always demonstrating not 100% compliance, this has proved much much more beneficial, and I think that has been yielded by the, the recent CQC inspection last week. Um, well, there is a, an extensive action plan. Our ICB colleagues do come in and uh, review uh, the work that's been done and, again, has been uh, noticing improvements. Um, I've been having uh, regular engagement meetings with the CQC and it is pleasing to note that they haven't had any further complaints since their inspection in January on the issues and concerns um, they, that, that were um, raised. So I'm going to pause there and if people would like me to go through some detailed um, actions under each one of those things, I'm happy to do so. Um, and thank you for those of you that were able to come in and see Basildon Hospital this week. And I'd really welcome anybody else that would like to come in 
and see and hear some of the improvements that have been um, done. So I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a number of questions. So I can't raise this. Uh, we had a great, some members of Horse did visit Basin Hospital, um, and it was a, fan, a great visit. I think the staff there were really amazing. There's some fantastic staff there, and you can really see there's a culture of real care and want to work hard to provide the best possible service. Um, so uh, the staff, as I say, are just amazing people. Amazing people. Um, but one of the things that really troubled me um, with this report was uh, these are basic CQC standards. They're basic. They're the minimum national standards that the government set. Um, and we got virtually the worst rating you can get for a hospital. Um, so I would like to know why we got here in the first place. Yes. So could you explain that? I can try. Uh, there are no excuses, absolutely no excuses. Um, some contributory uh, factors were that we had, um, over the winter period, an additional 180 beds opened uh, across the trust. Obviously, that requires increasing numbers of staff. We did, as you well know, you know, we were caring for an increased number of patients as well coming through our EDs and we had a lot of staff uh, vacancies. Now, they are absolutely no excuses um, at all, but they did and have contributed to those levels of poor, poor care where we were just lacking, not just nurses, but doctors, AHPs uh, across the trust. Um, and absolutely, I think there had become, um, staff were just uh, focused on doing and treating the acuity of the patients and not the focus on the fundamentals of care, as you absolutely say. Um, so they are some of the contributory um, factors. I am pleased to say we have almost closed all of those escalation beds um, now, and actually our recruitment has sign significantly increased both doctors and nurses. Councillor Fish. I'm really um, amazed to, to hear what you've just said about the uh, contributory factors. <clears throat> it sounds to me as if what, what you're saying is operationally things didn't work, but it seems that I, I don't get the impression that you're looking at it in a strategic kind of way, because I would have thought if you have a situation where you have shortages, then you need a strategic approach to, to make sure that those shortages are covered adequately. So we did um, uh, recruit uh, on a daily basis additional agency and bank nursing staff. That whilst it helps on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't provide continuity of care and we don't always know the standards of those agency staff. Having an additional 180 beds is absolutely significant with a vacancy factor which was about 22% at the time. Um, so as I said, th th there's no excuse. Strategically, we were managing the um, patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We did have patients in corridors. That's not acceptable, but that was the safest place for the patients uh, to be when they came in from ED. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Polly. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the CQC report looks at MSC as a complete trust. So we've got three hospitals there, haven't we, with extremely differing demographic. I would suggest South End has got a, a lot of more elderly demographic retired. So as regards the capacity assessments, the, the dolls. Um, is the report across the three hospitals or were, were some a little bit worse? No, I don't want to use the word worse because I know that Southend, for example, put the extra put cap, or the extra wards outside, put in the extra units. They've made every effort um, to avoid exactly what, what, what happened. And in fact, because of the level of care that 
South NDD does give its patients, some, some of those patients couldn't be taken onto those um, units because they needed one-to-one -one attention and, and needed. So there, there were some things that were put in place to try and alleviate the pressures uh, and staff were brought in. I have witnessed that myself. They were. Right, absolutely. Um, I, I just... I just think it's quite damning to put that right across the trust. I think there are some areas that um, the demographic and certain contributing factors might have worsened in some areas than, than others, and that was more population. I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I think that's a problem with being such a big trust. I mean, it's a foundation trust. Um, and, and of course, they only looked at specific wards, like medical wards, and that. So, it, I'm, I'm not moving away from the fact that the areas they looked at need attention, but I, I, I think it doesn't actually reflect some of the the other work that the nursing staff do, as as my chair has as as stated, and and as I'm sure we're all aware that um, you know the, the pressures that your staff have been under and continue to be under with. You, you know, with doctor strikes at the moment, you, 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 your nurses are, are just there day in, day out, working their socks off. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those comments. Uh, and I would just like to reiterate that, you know, what the CQC found in January uh, was not uh, acceptable. Uh, plans were in place. They continue to be in place. Uh, and as I said, I think the key challenge is that sustainability of what has been done uh, moving forward as well to ensure that our patients do receive the best care possible. Uh, I think you've got a question from Kim James. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Diane. Um, Hi, really it's, just, it's just a question. There was um, issues around the um, real times and people not being supported. One of the yeah. biggest issues we always get raised with relatives is that you have protected meal times and that these these relatives will be more than happy to go in at meal times and support their loved ones but they're told it's protected meal times and that you're out to recruitment for volunteers to help and i really think that somewhere there has to be that bit in the middle that if you've got somebody who's willing to come in and help you really have to take that because people are just being left. Not by not deliberately, but because the staff yeah. are so busy and it just seems silly not to have use the solution that's standing in front of you for some people. Absolutely, I totally agree, Kim. And what we have seen is yes, we do have protective patient meal times, and that's predominantly from intervention medical and nursing interventions that we're not doing drug rounds, that the doctors aren't coming to take bloods, etc., from patients. Uh, and uh, being completely honest, some of the um, nurses have taken that literally. So we've been having lots of conversations over the last two months. That actually, nobody knows our patients better than their loved ones and their carers. So they are not exempt at all. And we would welcome them coming back in uh, to the hospitals. Bill, that's yeah. a spite. Um I've been watching Basildon Hospital from very close quarters since I first arrived here in 2004. And it's been a very interesting journey. I, I am struck by one thing that you said this evening. And there are, started off by saying there are absolutely no excuses and then gave excuses. Well, I know you have to. I, I, I'm, I'm being pedantic. But... What strikes me is I've got the list of the board in front of me, including yourself or into your second decade there, Nigel Beverly, Andrew Pike. The people who have been in charge for quite a long time, I'll forgive the existing CEO because she's not long been there. I just get no sense at all. And I served, I was an elected member for a year and a half on the board and I left because I got no sense then of ownership, and of, and of real responsibility. So I just ask you, do you really think that is it acceptable that not one member 
of this board has stood up and made a heartfelt personal apology for your absolute failure in the management of this hospital. So, in terms of the, the question, um, I, I am sorry for the care that was provided and has been provided to our patients. Um, I, I have explained that was not um, acceptable and, and it isn't acceptable. Well, why didn't you resign? I think, I think we shouldn't go there at all, really. But I do, uh, I think it's very un unfair, but what I, we are at the point where we've had the report and now it's about we put it right. So um, can, you, can you be kind enough to give me an update on terms of the staffing? We talked about staffing being 22% below what was expected in January, February, which is really quite high. Um, what's the staffing situation now? So the uh, nurse staffing vacancy rate is 14% now, and come um, September, it will be around the 5% vacancy rate, excluding the turnover between now and then. So we have a significant uh, recruitment of international nurses, our recruitment of our student nurses, um, and staff that have been doing the um, nursing associate programme, as well as some uh, local nurses are wanting to come and work at MSE. Okay, thank you, thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you for coming along today, but you, I'm sure you can understand why people are upset because of course, this is understand. really basic care, people having food to eat. <laughs> Uh, having the right medication at the right time. There really, really are b basic tasks in terms of making sure people are safe in an environment where they feel already vulnerable. Um, so I look forward to the CQC report um, and I will follow, uh, I'm going to ask you to come back and yes, um, feedback on the CQC report and update. I would like a little bit more detail and maybe a report on where you're actually uh, are in terms of your action plan and I'd be grateful if we could have that um, a week or 10 days before our HOSC meetings so um, members can actually um, look at the documentation actually see where you are and then come back and ask questions on the information you provide okay of so, thank, thank you very much um, so I'll, I'll move on but I I, I, would, I would like to say that I'm really, after hearing what I've heard today in terms of the inadequate rating overall of the trust and the inadequate rating um, of the uh, uh, medical services, which, I, which I, I'm looking at improving, maternity services have a required improvement rating um, that it's really difficult to get a dental service in the uh, a, a dental appointment or find a dentist that will take you. Um, mental health service has also been inspected by CQC. It looks like it's got an inadequate rating. Um, um, GP appointments are said are hard to come by, although difficult to get, or harder to get than they used to be. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping this committee will hold you hold health to account because I don't think that people are thorough at getting the deal they deserve. I really don't. But, but thank you for your time today. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we move on to the next item, please, which is direct payments and support. I think, um, Ian, are you going to present? Thank you, Chair come this evening just to present um, some recommendations to the committee in relation to the direct payment support service. Currently, this service supports over 480 adult direct payment users and over 160 children that access direct payment support. The contract uh, currently will run till the end of February, at which point we will be out of contract, so we would very much like to go to the market and tender uh, in an open way for a suitable bidders to provide this service. Currently, it supports managed accounts, PA support, 
HMRC returns and a variety of other support services that are listed within the paper. Uh, presently, and um, at the time of writing this wasn't included because we hadn't carried them out, we've undertaken two uh, engagement exercises with direct payment users and we have two more scheduled in, one with an autism group and another one open to all direct payment service users. So I'll happily take any questions the committee has. Councillor Fish. So as I understand it from reading the report, um, <clears throat> what you're going to do is basically uh, put it out to tender, not um, say how much it's, it's going to be worth. You let the people that are, are bidding tell you how much they think it's worth and then you're going to go for the lowest price. Um, what weighting are you going to give to the other aspects of the service to make sure that we get the right person, not just the cheapest person? Uh, the recommended rate that we sought from procurement was a 60% weighting towards price and a 40% weighting towards quality. And you're satisfied that's going to deliver what you want? I think via appropriate contract management and con continuous engagement with the provider and direct payment users, I think it could be appropriately um, monitored and managed, yes. Um, since 2016, we've run engagement groups with all direct payment users, and we use that as a forum for them to express any um, displeasure or raise any issues with not only council officers, but also with the user-led organisation and the incumbent provider. And that will continue on, and that will be a forum that will be available to them so that we can address that outside of things like standard KPI monitoring. Okay, and final question. Do you have in your own mind uh, an idea of how much the service is, is worth? We have engaged in some soft market testing and we've looked at local comparators. Um, for example, Southend currently pay £180,000 per annum for their support service. But looking at the proportion of service users that we have compared to them, I would foresee a um, kind of mid £90,000 mark. But obviously, that is completely dependent on the bids that come through. Sorry, can I just ask one more question? Uh, how's that going to be funded? If the funding hasn't been available for the last 10 years to increase from £70,000, how's, how's that funding going to be available now? Um, it comes from the general fund, so it would um, be a general fund pressure that will be built into next year's budget. But obviously, until you test the market, you, we don't know an exact figure, so that will be, be part of budget setting. Any other questions, Neil? Neil Sp Councillor Spate. Uh, you may not be able to answer this question because it, it may be, I don't know if the word is commercially sensitive or not. Are we desperately unhappy with the level of service provided by Purple Zest? Or is it, I mean, one assumes we are, otherwise I wouldn't be doing the job. Um, because as it clearly says in the report, they, are, they, they, they were the only one who came in at, at a price we could afford. Um, and given the financial situation of the council, I just wonder whether it might be worth sticking with something that we know works, even if it's for another, an extension of a current contract for a couple of years until the financial situation becomes clearer, because it strikes me, and I may be entirely wrong, and I'm sure Ian will tell me if I am, that we, we, we're going through this exercise now, um, and as Tony alluded to, um, with a view to looking for the cheapest possible service. Um, and that, as, as I said in housing last week, that necessarily isn't the way forward because that doesn't equate to best value in a great many occasions. So I, I just wonder whether there is a, a do nothing option or a do nothing for another couple of years option. Well, <clears throat> I won't go into my personal opinion about the provider, but what I can tell you is all the KPI indicators we used to monitor the contract and feedback from service users indicate the service is performing well. Our main concern is that 
there's not capacity built within that contract to keep offering the level of service we have to service users for the foreseeable future. So the concern is that as direct payments are the preferred choice for personalization, to really give individuals a choice to control and direct their own care and support. If we do not go to market, then that capacity won't be built in, so the quality will suffer. That's fair enough answer. Any other questions? No? Okay. So, shall I go to what we're being asked to approve? That TOSC supports the contract to be put out to tender with no fixed price point, enabling the market to price against the activity required to ensure sustainable services for the life of the contract, the contract being four plus one plus one. Is that agreed? So 1.2 to this is the contract is resourced uh, to ensure statutory obligations can be appropriately met and responsible responsibility for awarding the tender will be delegated to the responsible director. So that's the director of corporate um, uh, director of adult housing and health. So just speak on that for a second. Okay. Um, there isn't anybody within Thurrock Council I have more respect for than the uh, responsible director in this instance, and I genuinely mean that. Um, but as we've seen on a number of issues across various departments of the council, we've had a propensity to allocate direct responsibility to directors, and this is, you know, and in some instances, those directors are absolutely trustworthy and worthwhile, and would 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 bring absolute the best of their ability to making a decision. But I am very wary of that delegation to one person. Now, I, I would be, feel more comforted if it was to be delegated to um, the director and the chairman of this committee or a nominee of cabinet or someone who was elected to be part of the discussion. And that's not casting aspersions on anybody, but I just feel it's a better way. But I may be in a minority on that. Thank you, Councillor Spate. Uh, Ian White? You, you actually raise a very valid point. I, I fear there is a slight error in this paper, what it should read, and the normal practice is to delegate to the director in consultation with the cabinet portfolio holder and that's what the statement should read so my apologies we didn't pick that up but your, your point is absolutely spot on. So with that amendment are we in agreement? Thank you. Right we'll move on to um, item 10 which is the work program for the coming year. Um, are you in agreement with the work programme as, as laid out in the papers? Right, okay. Are there any items that people would like to see on the work programme? Is it, is it the table up? Have you all seen the work programme? Okay. <clears throat> Chair, I mean, we presumably as a committee uh, at any given point in advance of a meeting have the opportunity to bring an urgent matter of business to the committee as indeed you, yourself did in, in terms of bringing the hospital on board. So I think it's, it is an absolute impossibility to have a work plan that covers every base at this point in time. As long as we have that facility to react in real time when things happen, uh, I'm happy to go with the way things are. Okay, I, I would like to add some things to the work plan. <laughs> okay, because I think there are, are, are some things that we really need looking at. Now, I, I have spoken to Councillor Polly, I hope you don't mind me raising this, in terms of we both feel that healthcare prevention, trying to keep people healthy is really, really important. 
and uh, we would like a group, a working group, to actually look at this topic. Um, I'd also um, like to look at mental health services. I think there's a big gap in our mental health services. Um, and I'm constantly hearing, uh, being a ward councillor, concerns being raised to me about mental health services. So I'd like a working group to, be look, to look at that as well. Um, I think in terms of reference, we can sit down and work out with, with officers and bring back to the next meeting with a view of the working group starting in September. Um, uh, other areas I was wanting to look at, um, which are things like GP services, um, um, ac access to appointments. Um, I'm really concerned around the number of cancellations or no, no shows for GP appointments. This seems to be wasting an awful lot of money and resource. I've got one health centre I spoke to today in the last month had 280 people not turn up for their appointments. That's massive. And I, th I would like to do some work with health and ourselves to promote a programme about encouraging people to cancel their appointments. I'm, I'm more concerned also about the fact that it's taking, that the government have introduced a system where people can book two weeks in advance. And since the system's come in, it seems to be there's more and more no-shows, uh, and that, that's concerning to me too. Um, in terms of the GP services, I'm very keen to making sure that people with learning disabilities are actually getting their annual health checks, um, particularly people with quite complex needs. And I'll, I'll be looking for some sort of report or some feedback on, on that. Um, I'm keen to also get people's experiences uh, and some feedback about abusing those services too. Um, I'm concerned about dental services. There's a report out last week. 10% um, you know, of the population trying to look after their own teeth in maybe with a screwdriver, I was hearing reports and things like that. That is scary. So I'm really trying to... I want to dig down into... Um, what is people's real access in Thurrock to NHS um, uh, dentists? Because um, speaking to a number of people, if I've done so in the last week, is that a number of websites say they accept NHS um, patients, but in reality do not. Um, I'd also like to look at advocacy services and do they provide the advocacy that people need? Okay, uh, I know we've, we've recently had a new tender, but I'm really wanting to look at that in terms of learned disability, mental health, and older people services. Um, and I'm asking Care Watch to, to look into that and to learning disability provider to give some feedback from their point of view. Um, and um, I'm going on a bit, but I, I do think we need to also look at co-production in terms of people who use our services. Uh, within the council, and I really am a great advocate of that, and I really want to look at people with mental health, learning disabilities, and older people having, uh, and, and people with physical disabilities having a say. So I'd like to um, talk to you more about that, Ian, and um, bring that here. Um, uh, I'd like to also look at maternity services, because maternity services has not got a great CQC rating, and I've, I've had some disturbing feedback from some people of these services. And um, I'll give one more, and then I'll go to Councillor Spate, which um, I like to look at ambulance services um, because I'm looking at response times and are, are we responding when we need, in, the, in a timely manner. Uh, I know the pressures that are on those services, but I'd really like to dig down into that a little bit more. Councillor Spate. That is a really admirable shopping list. It is, I don't think anybody sat in this room would argue against any of those things. But we have to be pragmatic and we have to be realistic. And I'm pretty blunt, I was pretty blunt with our friend from Basel and Hospital earlier on. Um, and, and I would love to engage with all of those subjects, but it's just not practically possible. Um, 
can I, can I just well, say? Can I just say what I was going to say? So uh, I was just going to ask for an opinion, and it could take the, an opinion of, of, the, of the room. Next week, I'm sitting on a meeting of the um, Constitution Working Group. Now, we as a committee are limited by the Constitution of the Council, as I understand it, to six councillors. And I'm pretty certain that even if we opt increase that to eight or nine or ten, we probably wouldn't get them anyway. It, it's, there are people who are prepared to do and there are people who are prepared to, to sit by the, by the, by the by side. Um, that was a, a very extensive and, and great shopping list and, and uh, it's not really the business of this committee but I'm, I'd like to take the advice probably of the experts as well just to guide me when I sit on the constitution working group next week that could we maybe look as a council wider than just this committee at the opportunity to bring lay people aboard or even professional people to come on board to help us because a lot of those things that you raise will need a working group or a task and finish group or something like that but we just haven't got the bodies to do it as we stand in any sort of reasonable time scale because I'll be dead before you get there at the end of that shopping list I just would is, is that a way to try and help us achieve our work aims and our work program sorry for being a bit daft but we've got to try and find solutions right um, I'll come back to your question in a moment if I may okay Councillor Fish um, yeah, I mean, I think they're the right issues that, we talk, that you mentioned. Um, I think they're issues that are of real importance to the people of Thurrock. And if we can actually do something on each of those, at the end of the year, we will be able to say that we have made a real difference for people. But I do think we need an element of focus in all of those. So we can't possibly cover every issue to do with mental health but um, you did talk about uh, particular aspects of it, and I think that's probably a reasonable way of approaching it. Councillor Polly. Sorry, sorry, Kim. Um, really, it was just to say that obviously with, between Health Watch and the Coalition, we already are out talking to lots and lots of people about their experiences so we, we have people that are happy to sit on focus groups and things. So the element of the real voice and the people, we're already doing that. That's, that's our job. So I understand that you'd need the right people here to answer to that. But quite a lot of those things on your list are things that we, are, we have got on our priorities list. So I'm just saying some of that background work could be being done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Chair. So, oh, uh, not wishing to add to your list in any way, which I really don't want to because it's a very comprehensive list. But as you'll be aware, that um, three areas, pharm pharmacy, optometry and dentistry, uh, was devolved to the system, so Mid and South Essex from April yeah. this year. And so if it would be helpful, we'd be happy to uh, perhaps offer a presentation about how we are now managing those three areas, which might encompass a wider breadth of that that kind of range of services which we know will be of concern to residents and, and perhaps uh, Alex and I can take that back to our colleagues and see if we can offer something that encaptures all of those things or encapsulates all of those things. Um, secondly, on the point about prevention, uh, Chair, which is a point very well made, uh, Ian will be aware that um, your Director of Public Health, Joe Broadbent, sits on our um, Population Health Improvement Board and so is very well versed in the work that's happening at a system level around prevention. And perhaps I can offer to myself to support uh, Ian and Joe uh, with a pr uh, presentation or, or uh, something around the area of, of prevention and the work that's happening across the, the integrated care system, both health and social care. I'd be very happy to support that if, that, if that's helpful. Alexander. If I just may follow up, Chair, um, we got agenda item penciled for IMWC for 31st of August. We suggest maybe we bring those items instead and in September, as outlines come and talk to you about buildings again. Um, we've got some good news as well around oral health for children we can talk to you about. There's some funding coming. We've got some ideas that we could present and hopefully for the good news for the councillors. I am previous dental commissioner, so hopefully we can make some headway in that as well. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't clear on that. Sorry, could you just repeat that again? I'm suggesting 
could we bring the update on delegated services of Tom's Dental and Pharmacy to you on 31st of August and then come in September with the INWC? That's what I was understanding, that you, you're going to remove the IMC as Correct. an agenda item. Yes. But just give us an update on the, on the other services. Yes. And then come back in September with the IMC. Correct. Uh, sorry, November. I, yeah. I, on that point, Chair, I do see that in, in January we do have an EPUT update. So as regards mental health services, um, we could perhaps contact them ahead of time. And yeah, I think some of these are partly on the agenda already. I just think that some of this needs shaping into something. This, well, um, I know it's ambitious, Councillor Spate, um, um, but you don't win a prize for s sitting back. So I am an, I'm going to be ambitious. I'm going to work with, with Ian and people from health and the local authority to actually make, try and make what I'd like to look at into a pra practical... Um, package and some of it may be just about notes rather than actually having a full presentation or um, uh, having a full report. I'm only really looking at two working groups which I'm, which I'm hoping will have a, a start and finish. I'm not proposing any more than that at the moment. Sorry Councillor Piccolo. Thank you Chair. I just one of the <coughs> One of the items that you brought up here is just when you look at it, is no-shows. Um, I find it very hard to work out how we as councillors can have any effect on people not showing up for appointments. Um, it's, it may be because they've given, been given this opportunity now to book appointments two weeks in advance and they haven't got the decency to cancel that appointment first. But we're not going to... We're not going to stop that. That's a service that was put in place because we thought it would be helpful for members of the public seeking medical um, advice. But I don't see how this committee can do anything to affect no-shows. So I'm not particularly happy that that will, might be one of the working groups or one, one of the things that we look at. I think it's about trying to work with health to look at how we can promote uh, as a local authority and health working together about promoting if you make an appointment and you know you're not going to show up this is how you cancel your appointment and, and, and just to try and reduce those I mean I think um, I don't think you'll solve the problem completely I agree with you I, I don't know if they don't show up it might be because they've got better or because they've accessed the information they want, the service they wanted from someone else other than their local doctor. Um, if that's the case, I'm sure if they receive the service, it goes on the medical records, which the doctors have access to. Is there no way um, that it can be flagged up if something comes in to a doctor to say that they've received this treatment? Um, that the, the, um, the, the person they've got in the surgery that deals with the, all that type of thing could look to say, well, they've got an appointment coming up, but they've obviously now been seen with this. My, I must admit my doctors are very good. They're still taking on patients. Um, I can get an appointment the same day if I want one. Um, perhaps I'm an exception, you know, perhaps my doctor's an exception to the rule. Um, but... I, I, I say, I won't, go, I won't labour the point any further. It's just that I think we're trying to solve a problem that we might have uh, very little influence on. Uh, again, Chair, we'd be very happy to support with an item around that because obviously it's something which our um, primary care networks are acutely concerned about and if we can support with that, we will. And, and Chair, just on, on Councillor Polly's point, if I may, just so we don't we're really clear we don't raise expectations um, and, and then dash them because we, we know this is a concern which Councillor Spike and others have had. Um, we, we noticed that um, our Alliance Director was speaking earlier about being able to bring proposals forward, uh, alternative proposals for the INWC. 
in September, but we noticed that the meeting schedule is the 31st of August and then 2nd of November. So um, perhaps we can take a conversation offline, Chair, as to when is the most appropriate point for us to bring proposals forward to this, com to, uh, to this um, committee because we don't want to kind of, um, you know, have ourselves set up for the 31st of August and then actually just only be able to do another update at that meeting rather than actually bring the proper proposals which I think members want to see. So can, can we uh, perhaps have a conversation offline about when it best suits the uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the board and, and, and when we have the meaningful presentation that, we, that members really clear, clearly want to see. Okay, thank you, Ian. So I share and support your ambition, Chair, but I'm also minded by um, Councillor Spade's point in terms of just the pragmatism of some of this. So there is a, a programme of work um, set out already um, as a committee, you need to, I think, quite think quite carefully about how you might want to uh, deal and scrutinise with that um, wide-ranging list of topics in the context of what's already on the plan, because there are some potentially major things that that Hosk historically would be very interested in say things like the annual public health report needs to come the imc certainly needs to to come back uh, complaints about adult social care it's absolutely right that you scrutinize services so I, I guess my caveat is if you want to put something on you need to decide what you you want to take off um, unless we can find another way of dealing with it so the working groups is one way but that is of course uh, requires resource as well. Uh, the other obvious one is briefing notes. Um, and I, I wonder on something like mental health, which is such a wide ranging topic, whether if you started with a briefing note, it might allow you as members, and I, again, I'm happy to have a conversation offline with one or all of you, but it might allow you to, fo on, to, to focus down on, on what would be of most interest and most relevance for you to to scrutinize further at maybe a, a, a committee meeting or or, or or a working group yeah i think that's an excellent idea thank you so what i propose is i, I know sorry councillor fish um the thing with briefing notes is what's their status are they um a note which is meant to be discussed by the committee once it's been published or are they just meant to be read and they're not part of what the committee does? Well, the answer to that is up to members of the committee. So um, it's a written note on something that committee members have requested further information on. Um, if having read and digested the note, you feel it would be worthy to have a further conversation at committee or, or uh, exercise your right to undertake further scrutiny, then that's absolutely within the rights of, of members. So it's a, it's an, inf it's a, I'm not sure it's about status, it's, a, it's an information sharing mechanism that allows you to take further decisions about what you might want to scrutinise. Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, earlier um, at this meeting, we did all agree to our terms of reference as well, and we are to scrutinise the planning provision and operations of the health service in Thurrock. Um, one, one of the items that, but we also have the capability to work in partnership um, and act as a member of a regional or sub-regional local health scrutiny network. So uh, as we know, we are resource poor in many ways. And something y you alluded to was uh, East of England Ambulance Service and when we're talking about the MSE the, the Mid and South Essex Hospital Foundation Trust services that affect, affect Thurrock will be sometimes because of situations that Basildon might be on divert so ambulances have to go to Broomfield, something like that so that might be, that would be a piece of work I have to remove myself from for obvious reasons um, but that might be something that might be worth looking at, at uh, Essex and Southend 
to do a bit of joint up work in there and perhaps some feasible sharing. Um, I very much welcome Kim's uh, input and I think we would miss a trick, like we said to the nursing uh, director of Basildon, that don't reinvent the wheel. The people are already out there, we've got contacts. We could perhaps look at seeking their advice if they would even survey their 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 focus groups and that to, to get some feedback to see if there's the appetite. Um, as I say, I think we've already got a full working programme, but there's nothing there that I can see we could we could move. Um, I'm even a little bit reluctant to to substitute the August IMC update um, in all truthfulness because I think two months like from from July to would it be November you're coming back that I, I would have a concern on that so um, and also you, you mentioned about health checks um, on I sit on a separate committee that sat last night and the, the, there was some there was some there was an item on there about health checks being done for um, a certain demographic within the community. So again, there might be some information from there that we could poach and to look into. They're, they're just thoughts of mine at the moment, Chair. Okay. Sorry, Sorry but, um, uh, when I was um, doing a quick bit of online research about the earliest subject matter, um, and I quoted that meeting in 2018 of the um, joint um, scrutiny committee, which looked at the bigger issues. Um, and indeed, I think the only person still here uh, who was at that meeting was, was Jenny, indeed, who was the clerk. And, and it was quite interesting that um, the other two authorities had named their councillors to attend, and Thurrock hadn't, it was to be arranged. Um, but uh, d does that level of scrutiny on a wider level still exist? Do those committees still exist? Thank you. Um, not as far as I'm aware at the moment. The, the view that members, rightly or wrongly, have taken in this committee in the past is a reluctance to scrutinise jointly with other authorities across Mid and South Essex. And I think the reason, or one of the disadvantages, is it dilutes political voice for Thurrock. So if there were a proposal that may benefit some areas of Mid and South Essex, but not Thurrock residents, where you have a joint scrutiny function, um, Thurrock's voice may be diluted. But again, that's entirely a, a, a matter for, for members on this committee to take a, take a view on. Yeah, I mean, my view on that is, as we just talked about things like ambulance, which is a regional service, um, and the hospitals trust is now for better or for worse, it's a, it's a three hospital regional service. If we've got such a lot of things to do, if there is any way we can cut a corner, and, and I couldn't give a monkey's stuff about political rhetoric, um, you know, and, and actually if this council became more friendly and stopped, spent less time playing Yabu sucks politics, we'd get a lot further on. Um, but that's a debate for a different day. Um, but I just think every opportunity to be explored, if, if, if that body still exists in some way, shape or form, then if, you know, if it's only one person going and then reporting back, we might bring back some good ideas. I don't, I don't know, I'll just leave it out there. Okay, thank, thank you, um, Councillor Spate. Can I make a suggestion? Okay, can we agree on the two working groups? Yes? Do I, do I have your support on the two working groups, which is looking at staying healthy uh, and the other one, mental health, but I accept mental health needs a very defined brief. So what I propose at the next meeting for both groups, we come back with a defined brief for each group. Yes? In terms of the other things, what I'd like the opportunity to do is explore some other options. I'll accept the fact that some may not happen. Um, but I, I want to be ambitious, and um, uh, and I'll come back to you at the next meeting. And it may mean that we just end up with the two working groups, but I'd, I'd prefer to do as much as what I'm talking about as possible. Is that fair enough for you to sign, sign off at the next meeting? 
So I think I'd like to have the opportunity to meet Ian, other health people, and Jenny um, to actually see what we can do. And I accept your point, uh, Councillor Spate, um, that it is a rather heavy work plan. Chair, could I just make one more session that we involve Kim in that as well as the patient voice? Because I think that's, that's really, or the resident voice, that's really, really important in trying to shape um, some of those, the, the work and the questions that those groups want to focus on. Okay, and I'd like Councillor Polly if she's available too. Okay, so that would be great. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Um, can I conclude the, uh, the business of the meeting this evening and um, declare the meeting closed at, I'll, I'll make that about quarter past nine. Many.